Bottom here. Hello, welcome to the latest video. This one's about Frank Side Bottom. And you have definitely been spoiling it. And if you carry on like this, then I'm chucking you out of our fantastic show business duo. Because if the truth be known, I hate you. <laughs> See how you just swept along? She's only a piece of carpet. Who I used to put on from the very earliest days. In fact, I'm pretty sure that I was one of the first, if not the first person in London to put Frank on. And I'll tell you all about it and about the exciting times we had and the strange times. Oh, it's my proper telly show. Just to say that most of the books about him and the documentaries miss out this early part, this bit in London, which was quite an important part of it. And I'll tell you why after this. But over here we've got something absolutely fantastic. Oh, what's that? Actually, that's portable. You can carry it round in your car or on your bike. And what happens is pop stars use this, you know, like at Madness and the Thompson Twins. So come on, Elena, send us a message in, and it's called email. And you take it round and you send messages to each other. Fantastic, eh? Have we got anything here? You must call your mum and... Oh, I'm, I'm in trouble now if my mum finds out I'm here. Right, are you going back in your box now? No, I don't want to. Oh, you've got to, because there's actually a fantastic video coming up. So let's all sit back and watch this. Thank you. Right, well, those who know, Frank Side Bottom was a character created by a guy called Chris Seavey. Right, now, Chris Seavey is the man standing here who is uh, who was responsible for the all-time classic, if you remember it, I'm in love with a girl on the Virgin Manchester Megastore. Check out like some, one of those. Something like Any that. Any combination. I'm in love, he's in love with the girl on the Manchester Virgin Megastore. Check out this. The first one we did was a black and white one. It's just mm. redone it into colour so you can buy it as a colour game. And that, what, you, you buy the record, plug it into your... Well, you simply computer. play the B yeah. side into your computer, which stores yeah. the information. Then you can play your record as a normal record and play the games or watch the displays. Right. Chris was... A, an eccentric, exciting, talented man who, from an early age, had the great ideas. He had great marketing ideas. He was way before his time. He formed a record label. Chris was a Manchester guy, timpily, and he was one of the most exciting and strangest people I've ever met. We, we had our ups and downs over the years, but um, he, was like, he was like a volcano of ideas. What Chris wanted to do was create something that entertained people and blow their minds. What, well, you're going to make a computer game? So I'm going to enter the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> Frank was supposed to be a minor character who just took over. He was on all the Saturday morning kids shows. Come on, have a go. Get your face right in there. That's it. He was showbiz royalty. <laughs> Being Frank. It was a fraction of his talent. The dummy can't survive without you. You can't survive without the dummy. So you grow to hate it. It was schizophrenia, almost, that was involved. Ah, ah, ah. It just went off the rails. He could take an awful lot of abuse. So he wanted to be recognised for everything else he'd done. Darling, I can't spend another day. I think Chris should be remembered for being too wonderfully strange to ever make it in the mainstream. What's been the highlight of your show business career? Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney. That would have been if I'd met him. He was an absolute genius. He was one of the few people I have met in my life that I would say that he was a genius. I met Chris because this is about 84 or 85. Frank Sidebottom started in 84. I started the cricketers in 84. So it would be around, he was already just starting, I think. It was like, there was already a bit of a buzz. The woman that worked for, for me at the time as my secretary, a sister, was a woman called Rebecca. Wherever I am, I'm always 
and she was one of the lead singers in a band called the Rhubarb Tarts. And another one of the singers in the Rhubarb Tarts, Melissa. That's what my daddy said to me. Mentioned Frank Side Bottom. Hello, Frank Side Bottom here. To me. So I rang up and asked speaking to Frank, and Chris was in the part of Frank. Now the thing about it was when Chris put on his head because he had a papi and mashy head subsequently replaced after my time by a uh, I think it was a fiberglass one now a lot of this stuff in the early days is not documented because the documentary that they did on him after he died concentrated on the Manchester thing so it interviewed all the people from Manchester and a guy called John Ronson who you might know as the writer he wrote um, various things the man who stares at goat I mean we could have written a film in which Chris, the sort of innocent, chaotic, lovely Chris who didn't care where everything went wrong, mm. or we could have written a film about the sort of, you know, the, the sort of more troubled, obsessive Chris. It, it was fraught, you know, there were problems. <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. And he worked with me subsequently at uh, Time Out. So I, so, so I knew John all ready from the Frank days, but I also knew him as well at Time Out. And it's fair to say, I think, that John and I have a mild... Um, rivalry. So one reason why the early days are not documented is because John Ronson, who documented a lot of the stuff, wasn't around then. Because he came afterwards. In fact, he met Frank Sidebottom at the Cricketers, which was the pub in South East London, if you didn't already know, that I used to run in the 1980s. So, it used to put all kinds of things. If you don't know about the Cricketers, there's a link up there to a video about it. So that will ex explain much more. So let's just take it that it was a pub in South East London that put on a lot of interesting music back in the 1980s. So, I rang up Frank and I spoke to him and Chris, as I was saying, was always in the character of Frank Sidebottom. If he was in, if he was, if he had a, a, on his head or if he was speaking as Frank, he would be Frank. He would be a different person. It's like, I don't know if you know, but comedians, when they go on the stage, like Stuart Lee is a very good example. Stuart Lee on stage is nothing like Stuart Lee off stage. Because to get on stage and do what they do, these people who are normally mild people, shy people, Chris, Chris CV, he could blend into the background. So when Stuart Lee goes on stage, he portrays the comedian Stuart Lee. Now, can I just make clear at this point, right? I am not saying that I'm Jesus, okay? I'm off stage, he is the actual Stuart Lee, the man who writes the jokes, the man who is the brains inside the brash exterior on stage. Are the little cracks in society where you could survive while you were figuring out what, what you wanted to do, and then become a comedian, playing to an audience in a town who could afford to live there to watch you, that is all gone. I do appreciate your support, but please subscribe if that's what you want to do. I'm not going to force you to do it, but it would be nice. I'm going to count to five, and when I've counted, I will again go back to my chat about Frank Sidebottom. One, two, three, four, five, so. When Chris was playing Frank, you could not call him Chris. Well, well, you might call him Chris, and people did. And he would not answer you. He would, like, ignore you. He was Frank. So bear that in mind. So when I rang him up to book it, going back to that again, we've been around in a big circle there. But when I rang up to book it, he spoke to me as Frank. And he asked me what it was and how much I was going to pay him. And I think he was quite surprised that I offered him. Because obviously, he had a drive down from Manchester. He... He actually had a band, and the band contained people like Mark Radcliffe. The driver at that time was Chris Evans, the radio DJ, not the Hollywood actor. But he certainly was for um, several of these shows. So it was quite a thing, so, so I paid him a reasonable amount of money. And from the start, he... I mean, he and the cricketers were very well, well suited. The thing about Frank is 
then as now, you either liked it or you didn't. It was definitely a Marmite type of comedy. In fact, Chris I know is a friend of Ted Chippington, who was the man, for enough, who inspired Stuart Lee to take the stage. Now, Ted, I used to know, because he was the roadie with a band I used to work with back in the 1980s, well, the 70s and 80s, slightly earlier than all this, called Here and Now, and Ted was their roadie. Hey, you've got no time left to amuse you. He used to enjoy winding people up. A lot of people wouldn't take what he did as being actual comedy. I will try and slip in a little bit of um, Ted into this bit now so you can see what I'm talking about. Bob Monkhouse, there's a man, eh? He's a good bloke, Bob. I've learnt this one off him, I've make a joke out of anything I can. Anyone got a topic they want to hear a joke about? You what? Shoes? Okay. I was walking down the road the other day, I had my shoes on, this bloke comes up to me, he said, uh, ta, ta for the railway station is away from me and mate. I said, uh, one mile. He said, one mile? I said, ah, one mile, roughly speaking. Couldn't be too sure, you know. You didn't find that funny then, well. At the Cricketers, we got on very well. I got very well with Chris and with Mike, the manager who was also playing drums. To start with, Mark Ratcliffe was the keyboard player. Now, he was already making a name for himself as a DJ, and he was a producer, I think, at this stage, on Radio 2, something like that. He was definitely producing Picker, he did it radio, then he became a producer on Radio 2, then eventually became a presenter, and, well, the rest is history, as they say. Him and Mark Riley became Mark and, what's it, Mark and Lard or whatever, on Radio 1. But back then, he was playing playing a keyboard. So he was, like, a quite a successful radio man who enjoyed being I think the I think he played actually he played a character too Mark Ratcliffe played the part of I got this right Emerson Lake I think it's Emerson Lake who was Frank's greengrocer from Timperley which is the um, in the Frank story is where Frank lived with his mother yes it's on the increase everywhere isn't it eh? Crime in your local shop. In fact, I've got an expert here who's nipped out to his local shop. In fact, my green grocer, Mr Lake. He's down at his local shop. <laughs> Come in, Mr Lake, with your report about shoplifting. Shoplifting? No, yeah. no, stop taking. I said there's no shoplifting going on at all. No. No, I sent you down there. If you can't do a thing about shoplifting, come back here. Stop taking it. Just get yourself back here. I need you on the keyboard because... And as this grew, Mrs. Merton... Tonight we're having a party. ..who was totally Frank's idea, which was... which F Frank's wife's friend was Caroline Ahern, who Frank... who Chris, or Frank, asked to play the part of Mrs. Merton in a radio thing, because Chris was an arty guy. He'd done artworks and things, he'd done cartoons, he'd done storyboards, in fact, a lot of these posters and these illustrations had a special code around it. it. It turned out. And this was cracked after he died by GCHQ, believe it or not. So Chris was a very complex man. Very strange man as well, which I will come to that later. That was good, wasn't it? Oh yes, very entertaining. Well, nice of you to say so, little Frank. I used to give him total freedom at the cricketers to do exactly what he wanted to do. I think more... Then he got up in the Manchester area, to be honest with you. So he used to enjoy coming down, and he came quite a lot. I mean, in the three or four years, between 84, 85, whatever, and the time we left in 1990, he played at least three or four times every year, possibly more. At Christmas, he used to do two or three shows. I didn't keep records of who we had on at the Cricketers fun now for me to look at now but I do remember him doing a series of lectures as Frank signed a bottom lectures which I think was every Friday for about four or five weeks one year that I think was about 86 or something like that and so he going to do he, he he did Christmas shows and he was getting the stage where he, the cricketers became his like London HQ 
which, when you look at the films, the documentary that was made, and the TV programmes, and the book, primarily the book by Mick Middles, the Manchester-based music journalist, he doesn't mention the, these cricketers at all. Not at all. But it was quite a big part of the Frank side bottom story. Anybody who was there and other people who were involved will know that Chris came down to London and he stayed with friends and it got quite complicated because he was married and um, there was a girl I was seeing who he was also seeing too and it turned out that Mike also was seeing it. So it's all very weird, it was all very involved. We used to go out for drinks together when he was down in London, we used to go out for meals and things, and I used to lend him money and whatever, and, and he used to pay me back, I used to give him advances for shows. So there was, because the thing about Chris was, he was a financial disaster zone. He could, he was constantly being evicted, he couldn't pay his electric bills, but he was constantly getting money in. That's the strange thing. He had, at one stage, he, he got this big uh, TV show on ITV, and, and they gave him thousands of pounds, but he spent it on stupid things. That's the thing about Chris. Frank was a very childish character. He was 35, he lived with his mum, he had a very naive way about him that was part of the humor the fact that he could basically say things to people which appeared naive but actually was chris being very um very deep in it really because like a lot of things were very perceptive but they seemed naive it is very hard to explain the frank side at bottom humor unless you were there unless you experienced it and his ad libs he was just like he's brain was actually but it was all as frank he used to have like cardboard sidekicks like he had little frank <laughs> it's basically like a big head and obviously a cardboard body and he would draw this himself so he would like draw this and there was little Inez which was little Frank's girlfriend and all these things so but he used to give away these cardboard things he would draw to people so then he had to do all this and he used to do everything himself by hand and I have seen him spe I mean he would stay up all night doing a poster that he would just point to once on stage and, he, and it'd be all hand coloured and and it might take him like two or three days just to make his post and it would be like and then he would and then he'd just leave it behind so i can remember one night he came off stage at the cricketers and it was a strange night i can remember it being a strange because they always were a strange night it was either a total triumph or it was like a total disaster i think we had two total disasters not disasters they were just like there were people there that didn't make it funny or he upset somebody in the audience and it just sort of it bit out of hand but normally it's a total triumph and one night he came off stage and he was and he was actually arguing with little frank uh, and he went in the dressing room which at the cricketers was the kitchen and he would literally in there by himself arguing with his own uh, puppet answering in the various voices so he'd be arguing as frank and then answering as little frank he used to do cover versions on stage like like he used to do a version of um queen we will rock you you say you're gonna be this kick in a cat oh god your turn we will we will rock you to do um um sex pistol song anarchy in timpani all together now He was wild. I mean, he could drink. He would just drink to excess. He would just drink. He would just. And, and also, I was reading in the book that his uh, flatmate later on said that he went out to buy some drugs. And he got this like weird mix of um, speed and coke. 
which was like so powerful, just one little line of it would like knock you out. For, and he took it around there, apparently Chris took the whole lot in one go. This is like, like a week's supply for two people or something. So anyway, not that I'm condoning taking drugs, especially not at my age. The night that John Munson joined the band was at the Cricketers, um, because Mark Ratcliffe apparently had a radio show to do. It seems that John Ronson, the writer, has um, changed history. Here's an article he wrote in The Guardian in May 2006. Of course, Chris Seavey was still alive then. And he says, um, In 1987, when I was 20, I put on concerts for the Portland of Central London. I became friendly with an agent from Cheshire called Mike Doherty. He looked after Ronnie Corbett, but... His true calling was being Frank Sidebottom's drummer. One day, Mike phoned me in a panic and said, Frank's playing a show in London tonight and our keyboard player can't make it. Do you know any keyboard players? I can play the keyboards, I replied. Well, you're in, he shouted. But I don't know any of the songs, I said. Can you play C, F and G, he asked. Yes, I said. Well, you're in, he shouted. I arrived at the venue, the Cricketers in South London. Frank was preparing for soundcheck, blah, 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 blah. There you go. So it was actually at the Cricketers. This is what he said in 2006. We move forward to Frank, the true story that inspired the, the movie. Right, this is written later. This is written after Chris C.V. died, and it's a slightly different story because he says... One day I was sitting in the office when the telephone rang. I was alone. My predecessor's off dealing with some issue. I wasn't supposed to answer the phone, but it kept ringing. Finally, I picked it up. Ents, I said. There was a silence. What, the voice said? Ents, I said. Oh, the man said. I thought you said ants. Jesus. Okay. So Frank's playing at your bar tonight. See, that's changed, hasn't it? It's now at your bar tonight. And our keyboard player can't make it. And so we're having to, going to have to cancel unless you know any keyboard players. I cleared my throat. I play keyboards, I said. Well, you're in, the man shouted. I glanced at the receiver. But I don't know any of your songs, I said. Wait a minute, the man said. I heard muffled voices. He came back to the phone. Can you play C, F and G, he said. Yes, I said. Well, you're in, he said. The man on the phone said I should meet them at the sound check at 5pm. He added that his name was Mike and Frank's real name was Chris. Then he hung up. I looked at the receiver. I arrived at the bar exactly 5pm. The place was dingy even in the daytime. We were deep in a basement. That's it, except for a few men fiddling with equipment. What is going on? Again, I've been wiped out of history. Who who cares? So anyway, so he joined the band and it turns out that, I think I, I might have been doing the sound actually that night, because I used to do this sound um, quite often there. And I seem to recall that Mike, that the manager told me to keep John Ronson right down in the mix so that nobody could hear him, you know. But, there's a great story about later on after I'd gone f from the whole story because we, they sort of drifted apart after I stopped doing these cricketers. There's a great story about when somebody, his flatmate, after his wife um, kicked him out. So he hadn't played with Frank previously. So Chris said, don't worry about it. Pop down and then I'll go down the uh, pub with Mike and you stay with John Ronson and he can teach you all the chords. So, you know, quite well. So it's like, great. So anyway, he goes to the gig and there's John Ronson. And apparently he said the same to John Ronson that this guy would teach him all the chords. So there you go. That was Chris. That was, he, was a, he had a great sense of humour and he loved it when things went, went wrong. I think that's fair to say. Um, everybody else hated it, but he absolutely relished it. That's why his life was such tumultuous. I mean, he had the most 
horrible, well I would call it a horrible life, it was like everything seemed to go wrong for him all the time but he just seemed to relish all that and um, he was just the guy who didn't seem to care, that's the thing. He was, he, I think he lived it in the moment but, but he was always planning something, he always thought well, if I can do this, I can do that, then I can make it all right again and so he was always looking to the future and, and he was an eternal optimist and as as was Frank actually, I suppose Frank was a projection of, of Chris. Chris basically, and I parted, he went on to bigger things, I say, he, he actually had his own ITV show for a while and then it all went wrong with the um, drinking and the uh, drugs got in the way and we were reunited briefly because when I was doing the Rhythm Festival I booked him, I think it was the 2009 one, at, the last one we did I think at Twinwood, Clapham, the one in Bedfordshire, not the one in London. So. I booked him and I don't remember much about him. I remember him I mean, asking me what he should do and asking various things and we had a bit of a chat and his show was, didn't seem to me to have the same spark. Because don't forget, I knew him very early on, back in the, the early days of Frank, when he was still getting the act t together, where we would, it would be exciting. He wouldn't know what he was going to do half the time. He would have these great plans, he would have great ideas. Some of them worked, some of them went horribly wrong. But it was good, it was exciting. And that was, and it was one of the most exciting periods in my life. And he was one of the most exciting people in that period. And I shall always think of Chris and Frank very fondly. He died in 2010. Um, June of 2010, I was getting ready for that year's Rhythm Festival, so I couldn't really do much. Well, when he did die, he, he was totally skint, and so there was a John Ronson, I think Mark Ratcliffe, put out an appeal for people to actually contribute towards this funeral. I, I remember I gave, um, I think, uh, £50 or so. But whatever, so I didn't get a chance to go to his funeral because it was right during the middle of the Rhythm Festival but I shall regret that because I wish I'd gone because he was a friend and um, although we hadn't been close, we hadn't we didn't know each other apart from that one time at the Rhythm Festival, about 12 years I suppose. But anyway, it was an exciting time and I was proud to play a tiny part in the genesis of Frank side bottom. Brilliant! Right, well, we'll make that after then. <laughs> Shut up, my cop, that. Can, can, uh, can I introduce my little Kazuko? Can you what? Can, can I introduce my little Kazuko here? Oh, yes, go on, you do the voice. This, hello! <laughs> I, this is my ventriloquist act, you see? But I always get confused between no, words. No, 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 nobody's lips are supposed to move. <laughs> What's <laughs> that? <laughs> Hello, little Frank. I'm not doing it. You've got to do it. <laughs> if you don't tell the line, there'll be big trouble when we get on. <laughs> and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, please like it. Like it down below. Press the thumbs up thing. Subscribe. You know you should subscribe. Please subscribe. Yes, that would be good. And comment. Let me know what you think. Did you know Frank? Did you know Chris? Very great man. And thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. And next time will be a ramp, the second part of the Ramsgate tour. I hope you enjoyed the first one. If you didn't see it, please check it out if that's of any interest. And I'll see you for the next video. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. That's all, folks.